Bonjour and welcome to a special edition of Cronkite News from the 2024 Paris Olympic Games. I'm Blake Neiman. And I'm Luca Lindo. Thank you so much for joining us. Over the past three weeks, our crew of reporters have been spread throughout the glorious city of Paris, reporting on the summer games and the culture around it here in the City of Light. We start our show in the shadow of the Arc de Triomphe with a triumphant collection of the best basketball players from around the world. That's right, Luke. I caught up with three Phoenix Mercury basketball stars who traded in their purple and orange jerseys for the red, white, and blue. I just appreciate everything more now. You know, um, taking in the bonding, the, just seeing everybody, the sights, uh, really appreciating that because it can totally be different. Life may never be the same for Griner after her grueling experience in Russia. But one thing that will never change is the unwavering support from her day one partner in Phoenix, Diana Taurasi. I think I'll be more emotional for that, honestly. Um, you know, just any chance I get to be with D, basically my whole career has been with, with D overseas, um, USA, and Phoenix. Uh, she's taught me everything. And just being able to share this court with her, you know, for another Olympics is very special to me. Griner and Taurasi have the chance to win their third gold medal together. And for Tarasi, she could win her sixth, the most of any basketball player ever, man or woman. Yet the three-time WNBA champion is just focused on what's in front of her. Sometimes you can get um, confused by the winning, the losing, the medals, the trophies, the MVPs, the, all that stuff. And at the end of the day, all that stuff really doesn't matter. It's the work you put in every single day. Here in Paris, the Mercury's dynamic duo adds another teammate from the purple and orange. Kalia Copper. The former WNBA Finals MVP and first-time Olympian hopes Phoenix's large presence on Team USA helps attract other talent from around the WNBA to the Valley. We're a top organization and I want to continue to uh, let players know that Olympians play for the uh, Phoenix Mercury um, and, and just to get players to come and want to play with us. Three Phoenix Mercury players in the Olympics? That's certainly impressive. Absolutely, Blake. And two other Phoenix stars will be playing for the Team USA on the men's side. Devin Booker and Kevin Durant are very proud to be among five Valley Hoopers playing for the United States five-on-five -five squads. Yeah, I mean, we got Phoenix all over. You know, we have three on the women's team also, so, you know, we're well represented. Uh, the basketball town and, you know, we want to put, put the city on the map, so... No, no better way than winning gold. That basketball town is well represented here, despite there being over 5,000 miles of separation between Phoenix and Paris. Our Wilder Adams caught up with a few diehard Suns fans who made the long trip to see some of their favorite players take the court for Team USA. America's Golden Boys, let's they get it. They are Number like one. the two best players here. Suns fans Kerry Honene, John Damasco, and Matt Hosek flew thousands of miles from Tucson to France to watch Kevin Durant and Devin Booker play for Team USA. It's always nice for them to represent and represent the NBA, but besides that, representing Arizona. Booker has always been like the top dog ever since he, you know, finals, and Kevin Durant, he, there's nothing else. KD. Better, so. The Lakers and Celtics are the only other organizations with multiple Team USA players this year. And with two Sun Stars on the squad, Phoenix native Steve Ho couldn't resist making the trip. It's crazy. I like, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like, I never thought I would be here doing this. Anywhere you go in France, whether that's in Paris or Lille, you can see Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, Phoenix Suns jerseys all over the place. And we should give those two stars a lot of credit for the global brand they are helping the Phoenix Suns build. KD is one of my favorite uh, basketballers since he started with the Seattle Supersonics. I really like the style of uh, Devin Booker, his spirit uh, on uh, the ground, uh, how he plays. The silky smooth style Durant and Booker bring to the court draws fans from all over the world to the television screen. French native Axel Gaguar grew up watching the Phoenix Suns on television despite the 8-9 to nine hour time difference from Arizona. Seeing his favorite players in person has been a dream come true. It's uh, an accomplishment. So it's uh, near to me, so it's very uh, nice and uh, to the TV and here at Lille it's uh, particular. In Lille, Wilder Adams, Cronkite News.
Even former Valley Hoopers are showing out here in Paris. Jimmer Fredette, who spent a few games at the tail end of his NBA career with the Phoenix Suns, suited up for Team USA's men's three-on-three -three squad. And former Phoenix Mercury player Sierra Burdick played in her first Olympic Games for the U.S. women's 3x3 team. Before they took the court, I had the chance to talk with Burdick and some of her teammates about what the WNBA vet brings to the table. I prepare the same way um, for every competition. You know, I'm, I pride myself in my preparation. So whether it's just a women's series tournament or the World Cup or the Olympics, um, I go all in no matter what. So, but I will say it was an inspiring um, just moment to see the growth of women's basketball, to be a part of WNBA All-Star um, in a sold out crowd as you, you know, in footprint, uh, 17,000 people. So that was just an incredible experience and I'm glad I got to witness it. Burdick reunited with her head coach Jennifer Rosati, who coached Burdick in 2011 on the U19 women's national team. Together they won the FIBA World Cup and hope to repeat history on the world's biggest stage. It's pretty cool to have it come full circle and see her as a pro and as an adult and see where her journey has taken her. And I, she's my coach on the floor, so I trust her a lot and I think that that's mutual. And she just has a great way of being locked in, taking it seriously, but also having an open mind um, and being able to communicate, motivate, and find ways to make other people better. I mean, I, I think that's the most special thing about Sierra is she makes the three players around her play really, really well. Burdick boasts some of the most 3x3 experience on the USA roster dating back to 2014. That veteran status does not go unnoticed by her teammates. She, she keeps our team in flow. Um, she doesn't let us isolate. She's constantly moving. She's constantly talking to us. You know, if she sees us start to like back out and back down like we're going to go one on, she's calling the next set. She's calling the next action. And so just hearing her voice as a reminder all the time uh, is really helpful for us and it's definitely helped us grow. In Paris, we love the cabaret because uh, it's a place of uh, meeting, it's a place of uh, transgression, it's a place of uh, acceptation of everybody. Coming up on this special edition of Cronkite News in Paris, a look inside one of this city's oldest cabaret clubs and the role LGBTQ plus community plays in Parisian culture. It's what you do. It's how you do it. It's Arizona Living, your life. Join host Kate Longworth for a show designed to help you live your best Southwest life. Get a closer look at the most enjoyable experiences to be found in Arizona. From great day trips to delicious dining spots to fun activities for the whole family. There's no shortage of new adventures awaiting you. Watch Arizona Living, your life. Sunday and Tuesday only on Your View or streaming at yourview.com. Two, one. Coming up on the cut. Coming up on the cut. Coming up on the cut. How students can build their broadcast journalism portfolio with opportunities to learn more about on-air reporting and studio production. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at the cut underscore network and on X at cutASU. Welcome back to a special edition of Cronkite News here in Paris. We continue our voyage through the 2024 Summer Olympics with a trip down to the Seine River, where our Wilder Adams and Grace Johnson stand by with a stunning view of the Eiffel Tower. Some of those performances came with controversy. Welcome to Madame Arthur, Paris's oldest LGBTQ plus cabaret club. When it opened in 1946, Madame Arthur was thought to be one of the only places in Paris that was accepting of artists who are transgender. Now, decades later, Paris is one of the most welcoming cities for the LGBTQ plus community, a community that was at the center of the Olympics opening ceremony. The only way of using that as a tool to promote something that is so typically Parisian, uh, I think is the way that they did it. However, many of the opening ceremony performers were targeted with a deluge of negative comments on social media and even some death threats after a dance sequence that some interpreted as mocking Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Yeah, I think that we live in a, in a moment um, where 
every provocative choice became become a, a buzz, uh, and people are waiting for that, and they want that. What started as drag performances and a night of celebration resulted in controversy. Most notably, former President Donald Trump called the performance a disgrace, implying that it insulted the Christian religion. But Paris officials say the intent was not to offend, but rather to celebrate. The artist, the, 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 the guy who make the, the mise en scène of uh, all the, 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 the ceremony with Thomas Joly, he, he, he suddenly make, a, he suddenly make a light about what creating in Paris, like uh, the cabaret. Cabaret is a large part of Parisian life and a welcoming environment. In Paris, we love the cabaret because uh, it's a place of uh, meeting, it's a place of uh, transgression, it's a place of uh, acceptation of everybody. Paris is ranked as one of the most LGBTQ plus and trans accepting cities, and the cabaret scene has been revitalized because it's welcoming to everybody. It's, we are like refugees because uh, as, uh, as queer artists, we have uh, less opportunities in the artistic world. So uh, to, to arrive here is like, a, 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 it's a stage, it's a gift, it's a stage for us to express and to do what we want. Despite the controversy, performers realized the importance of entertainment like that of the opening ceremony. Of course, the, you know, the whole history of the queer community is inscribed within all of that. And I don't think it is only what cabaret is about, but it is necessarily also what cabaret is about because that community has given us so much socially, artistically, culturally, and it just cannot be dissociated. In Paris, Zach Bradshaw, Cronkite News. Especially for the Women's Eagle Squad, headlined by Nia Tapper and Lauren Doyle, our Alexis Heikman went down to the Stade de France where history was made. The 2024 Olympic Games has set a new standard when it comes to supporting female athletes. For the first time ever, this Games has had equal representation for both men and women. But one team in particular has been making headlines for its efforts in female empowerment, the bronze medal winning USA Women's Rugby Squad. I mean, I don't know what it's like in the States right now, but at least from what I'm seeing, I, I think it's everywhere. And so that the team is getting this moment um, and it's shining this light on, on women's sport and women's rugby uh, in a really cool way. U.S. coach Emily Bidewell is the first woman to coach a rugby team in the Olympics since the IOC added the sport in 2016. She made it a team priority to spread a message of self-love. From Alona Mar's body positivity taking over social media to head coach Bidewell's high women philosophy, young girls across the globe are being inspired. You don't have to be any less like emotional and loving and caring to play, to be an elite athlete, to, to be a world class athlete. Um, you um, that actually like is going to make your team um, better. Co-captain Naya Tapper explained that the high woman philosophy encouraged each player to think about who is that one woman in our life or multiple women in our life that motivate us and inspire us on a daily basis to keep striving. Bidewell said that this tournament was not just about the women on the team, but also for those who came before them as well as the talent that has yet to compete. A really cool thing um, that I got a lot of help on um, when they moved into the village is that each of them had a letter on their bed um, from a high woman of the past and then a high woman of the future. Each one of them had a letter from them. And so just trying to create this identity, our idea that it's like more than just us, like in this moment. Along with the letters encouraging the team, Bidewell felt some support from her past coach and mentor, Kathy Flores, during the final moments of the game. Somebody gave me her like last whistle and her necklace that she wore. And so since I got it a year ago, it's been in my backpack for every time we travel. I was like, I'm just gonna put it in my pocket. <laughs> so I had it in my pocket for the last game and that was really um, uh, pretty crazy and special. And the special moments did not end with the improbable win. International investor Michelle Kang gave $4 million to the USA Women's Rugby Sevens team to continue building up its program and inspiring women everywhere. The race for the gold in the 2028 LA Olympics starts now. Yes! 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 
So whether they're cheering each other on from the sidelines or supporting each other on social media, this team hopes to keep uplifting women across the globe. From Paris, Alexis Heichman, Cronkite News. Team USA made athlete mental health a priority during the Olympics. Leading that charge is a former Sun Devil. ASU was the, the building block for me to, to make me who I am. And, um, and it's a place that I just, it's, it's like my passion in life is, is ASU and, and giving back in sport. Rocky Harris bleeds maroon and gold. The three-time ASU grad, bachelor's, master's, and PhD, says he would not be at the Olympics if it wasn't for his Arizona State education. As chief of sport and athletic services for the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, the Tempe native is in charge of athlete care, making sure athletes are supported physically and more importantly, mentally. Now, the greatest part about this generation and the, is that they've really made um, mental health resources and support normalized. It's not something that you have to hide. It's just like physical health. It's like when you hurt your leg, you go get it fixed and you get you work on it to make it better. And that's the same thing. So we've um, expanded our mental health services. Harris worked at ASU during his college years. He then went into the NFL at 25 years old, followed by four years in MLS. He returned to Tempe as Chief Operating Officer for Sun Devil Athletics. From there, Harris joined USA Triathlon as their CEO, which led him to his current position. ASU Athletic Director Graham Rossini, a friend of Harris from their days working together at the university, connected with Harris over their shared love for ASU. always appreciated his enthusiasm. You know, just as an energetic guy, as I'm sure that you noticed when you were with him, and you know, just passionate about ASU. And so we were always bonded in our love of the Sun Devils. And um, yeah, just he's always been an enjoyable friend to be around and somebody that I've been able to look up to and count on for advice along the way. If you ask anyone who knows Harris, they'll say he is phenomenal at his job, but an even better person. Rocky Harris doesn't need to be the flag bearer or, or to leading the flag bearers to be the most caring person in the room. He would be that person if he was at the end of that line. Uh, but it was pretty goddamn cool to see him leading LeBron James and Coco Goff. Uh, you know, that's a sun devil up there. I mean, the Sun Devil for Life says his main priority is giving back to athletes through the power of sports and to always lend a hand to fellow Sun Devils throughout his career. It's, it is really all about the trading, the meeting of the people, the yeah. interaction. Yeah. How do you communicate with someone whose language you don't speak? It's through pins. And next, the sport of Olympic pin trading, the history behind the pins and how they unite people from around the world. Three, two, one. Cronkite News. Get real professional experience in areas such as reporting, broadcast editing, and behind the scenes production, such as technical director and audio. kill the mics. Or go out in the field and cover important local stories. Learn and master the English language. In a fun, welcoming atmosphere. Cronkite News. The future starts now. Welcome back to the Arc de Triomphe. The Olympic flame burns at a centerpiece for every Olympic Games, and this Olympic cauldron features a hot air balloon that floats into the Paris sky every night. That's where Mahir Sinhassen and Alexis Heikman join us now. And so right now we are right in front of the Le Museum with the beautiful Olympic cauldron right behind us. But Paris is not just for the Olympics. We've got beautiful art here, great food and wine, and we also have a growing culture of biking. That's right, Alexis. I found out that this biking culture has grown because of the Olympics, and it's only gonna grow as we go into the future. Options abound for Olympic fans when it comes to transportation to events. Car, bus, metro, and for some fans, bicycle. And the two-wheel way is no accident. Uh, Olympic, and the défi c'était de faire en sorte que ce réseau cyclable soit réalisé pour uh, pour les, les, les Jeux Olympiques, avec donc une ambition 
The city of Paris says they created more than 1,000 kilometers of bike lanes over the past 10 years. With the creation of each lane comes an increase in biking's importance to the community. Increase up the air pollution and noise pollution, and we just make the city better to live. Paris actually has the same amount of bike lanes as Phoenix in terms of miles. But 11% of the City of Lights residents use the bicycle to get from one place to another, which is much more than Phoenix. Fortunately, there are some strategies that other cities can use to increase their two-wheel transportation. If you provide good infrastructure uh, to people with a continuous and safe network, it works and you have more and more people uh, getting on their bike uh, every day. There are still some concerns as people worry that bikers are too close to cars and that some citizens may not understand the bicycle specific road signs. Pas forcément discuté, mais il semble qu'il y a encore des efforts à faire pour euh, que cette pratique soit euh, socialement euh, accessible à tous et euh, équilibrée dans son développement euh, territorial et qu'on ait aussi des efforts à faire pour euh, que ce soit une pratique qui soit euh, sereine. The games may only last for a few weeks, but the impact of cycling in the City of Light will be long-lasting. A key element of Olympic tourism and Olympic culture is pin trading. It's an unofficial sport that unites many and makes the game even more fun for some, as Grace Johnson explains. Phoenix native Marlon Demicologon is new to pin trading. I've collected about like 15 or 20 pins so far from all different places. Like okay. I just got one from Slovakia, I've got some from people locally in Arizona, and it's just a great way to meet other people. Demi Kalogon joins a community of passionate pin traders here at the Pin Trading Center, located by Club France at Parc de Villette. So this is the place to be for traders or just people that are quite curious or interested in, in pin trading in Paris. With this, however, being the very first Olympic trading venue hosted by the International Olympic Collectors Association, people are coming from around the world for these pins, trading for different countries, teams, sports, and growing the culture. This tradition dates all the way back to the 1896 Olympic Games in Athens. What started out as cardboard pins to identify athletes and media has evolved into an emerging phenomenon. And it's a hobby where athletes and fans can connect with people from all over the world. Mark Chestnut and Andrew Colo met over pin trading at the 2002 Winter Utah Olympics and have collected over 10,000 pins combined since the 1970s. It's, it is really all about the trading, the meeting of the people, the yep. interaction. Yep. How do you communicate with someone whose language you don't speak? It's through pins. USA athletes like Simone Biles and Steph Curry have even taken up the craze. And Dominican and Arizona native swimmer Jasmine Schofield says it's an obsession. Everybody does it and it's so much fun and then it just creates kind of like a little treasure hunt. Like. We've literally been up to like midnight some nights just scavenging for pins. We'll hang out around the rings in the village. Hundreds of these traders are in town for the big games, and if you pin them down, you may be walking away with an Olympic token. In Paris, Grace Johnson, Cronkite News. Coming up, while watching the opening ceremony, you might have noticed the custom Ralph Lauren jackets Team USA was wearing. We trace those jackets back to their very beginnings. Explore the Southwest style that makes the Grand Canyon State so unique on Arizona Living. Host Danielle Lerner takes to the road to showcase the people, places, and culture at the heart of our state, while offering up some exciting ideas for your next getaway. Whether you're new to the area or a longtime resident just looking for a bit of inspiration, discover all that Arizona has to offer on Arizona Living, Sunday and Tuesday only on Your View or streaming at yourview.com. Innovation at the Walter Cronkite School is pushing the boundaries of traditional journalism. Storytelling has evolved over the years. This is part of that evolution. Students in the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lab are using emerging technology to create scenes in augmented and virtual reality, coding playable games, and bringing the audience into the story. They're only limited by their imagination and their willingness to learn. Find out more at cronkite.asu.edu. Welcome back. Despite the pouring rain at the opening ceremony, the custom-made Ralph Lauren jackets for Team USA withstood the conditions. 
We spoke with the ranch that made the wool for the jackets, and they shared how the Team USA uniforms made it from the ranch to France. I'm Jeannie Carver, and our family ranch is the Imperial Stock Ranch. And this is our 153rd year of continuous operation, producing sheep and cattle, grains and hay. Collectively, we graze about 2.6 million acres in the western U.S., and we shear about 500,000 pounds of some of the best merino wool produced in North America in the summer of 12, 2012. I got a phone call, and I said, which yarn store are you with? And he said, oh, I'm not with a yarn store. I'm with Polo Ralph Lauren in New York. I said, really? I, I mean, I was in shock. Things like that don't happen to people like us, right? It's not even something you ever dreamed of. It's, it's beyond what you can dream. They ended up choosing our yarn for the first Made in America Olympic uniforms they did for the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia. And here we are, a decade later, still working with them. They have been an amazing partner. And for the first time, they've made the decision to feature wool in the opening ceremony uniform of a Summer Olympics, which to me has a really special, it's a really special um, decision they've made and an effort they've made for a lot of reasons. One, wool is the original performance fiber. We have our own little moment of glory because our wool is someplace really important. It's always really emotional. It's really emotional. I, I don't know what else to say. Maybe because we're nowhere near the Olympics in our life. We're far from New York City, and we're far from the glory of the Olympic Games. We do something that in many ways is forgotten, and yet it's, it's important for everybody's survival, and, but that's what we do. So we're not in those kinds of spotlights, but when you see this happening, you know, on the TV, it's like, it's, it, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, to think that our effort every day supports something like this. That's all for this special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Blake Neiman. And I'm Luke Galindo. And on behalf of the entire Cronkite News team here in Paris, merci and au revoir. For more Olympic coverage, visit cronkitenews.azpbs.org.